The eucalypt forests of Australia are home to some of the world's most loved animals. But it is the koala which has captured the hearts of people the world over. Eucalypt trees are their life. They sleep in them, fight in them, and mate here. These trees are their escape routes and territorial boundaries, and they feed exclusively on their leaves. No other animal of the Australian bush is so vitally dependent on these forests. Yet all over Australia, koalas face an uncertain future. the story of one remarkable koala, his community and their struggle for survival. In every koala society, there is one male who rules the roost. In this forest, it's Arnie who's the undisputed leader. Here in the New South Wales Tweed Valley, he reigns over 60 hectares of forest, a harem of females, and their young. Marie is carrying Arnie's progeny from last year. At one year of age, this youngster is nearly independent. Lulu is not yet sexually mature and still enjoying her adolescence. Here, most females bear Arnie's young. But it's not only females that concern Arnie. Dennis, a younger male, aspires to overthrow Arnie's dominance. However, the greatest threat to Arnie is not Dennis, but the change coming to his valley. A housing development is underway, a threat that is not unique to Arnie's forest, but facing koalas Australia-wide. Koalas were once widespread across eastern Australia. As Europeans arrived and eucalypt forests were cleared, koala numbers dwindled. Habitat loss has consistently been the greatest threat to koalas, and never more so than today. Steve Phillips is the biologist faced with the challenge of ensuring that Arnie and his community continue to thrive despite the changes. We're using information that's never been put in place before to try and conserve a koala population in an urban environment. If it works, it'll certainly set a standard for planning for koala conservation elsewhere. If it doesn't work, then Arnie and his group will have suffered a grave injustice and we'll probably lose them. It's a race against time, as science moves far slower than the pursuit of progress. Working with the Australian Koala Foundation, Steve has spent the last two years tracking the movements of all the koalas in the area. His findings have left no doubt about one thing. Arnie is exceptional. Well, in all the time I've been working with koalas, I've never come across an animal with his size, his stamina, and his just his sheer strength. And the first name that came to mind was uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. 
a name well deserved, for Arnie is more than 35% heavier than all the other males in his group. So you can catch koalas for 20 years and you see guys like this maybe one or two percent of the time. He's just, uh, yeah, Mr. Cool. We happened to come across him while he was moving about during the day. There was no way that he was going to escape the capture process and he took it like a gentleman. He just moved down the tree uh, to a position about five, six foot off the ground and then we grabbed him. He's just told us so much about koala society and, uh, and how it operates, what holds it together, relationships between males and females, just so many things. So uh, he is king koala. And a king must proclaim his kingdom. Arnie marks his territory using a scent gland on his chest. All males have developed this oil secreting gland by the time they reach sexual maturity. During the breeding season, the gland is more active, and whilst there are no visual signs of a koala's presence, the air is alive with their musky odours. Arnie's scent is his signature, and a warning to other males. These anointed trees are the bedrooms and battlegrounds of koala society. Without them, it would disintegrate. Dennis knows he's in enemy territory. Arnie's home range and its boundaries are all scent marked. The odour persists for a long time, probably as much as a year. Even when the animal's dead, the other animals respect those boundaries that have been put in place. Radio tracking has enabled Steve to plot each animal's territory. So this is Arnie's home range area and as you can see it clearly overlaps with those of uh, the females in his particular group. The home ranges of his rivals are scattered nearby around the edges. But as the dominant male, Arnie's range is clearly the largest by far. The significance of that is that he's on high nutrient soils with a large number of preferred food trees there. So his home range size is not just a function of habitat quality, it's there because he is who he is. But Arnie's domain will be carved up with roads and houses in less than six months. If Arnie and his group are to survive here amidst the encroaching development, special allowances must be made for their safety. Steve must convince the developers to put his research into practice. You know me, Nick, I haven't got much faith in speed signs at all. I mean, you only have to look around any urban area with koalas in it and you uh, get graphic evidence that people don't obey the signs that are put in front of them. And, uh, I think we've got to put in place something physical here that, that, that really controls the speed rather than something that, you know, maybe just a token gesture. Sure. Oblivious to these new threats, koalas are responding to the onset of spring. Arnie declares his readiness to mate. Dennis moves silently into rival territory, stalking females behind Arnie's back. He pursues Lulu up a tree. While Lulu is now ready to mate, she waits loyally for Arnie. The burdens of motherhood are great, so females produce just once a year. Marie's young is Arnie's son. When he's fully independent, Marie will seek out Arnie once again. When they get off, they've lost that little bit of experience that she has. They've got to start learning things for themselves, and it's a very hostile world out there. In 
In just a few weeks, he will leave his mother's home range. Eventually, he may travel as far as 60 kilometers to establish his own territory. It will be a perilous journey. These koalas are surrounded by urban development. There are no guarantees that this youngster will survive or find others of his kind. What the koalas are doing as they travel through that landscape, they're just not looking for food trees. They're looking for Arnie and his type. They're looking for that group because that's what keeps koala society alive and we've destroyed those groups. The animals will now die of old age and the populations will just disappear like lights going out. I have real fears for the long-term future of the koalas. Successful conservation will only come with a better understanding of how koala society functions. Steve's research is uncovering one of the most comprehensive patterns of koala behaviour ever recorded. One of the interesting things that started to happen as we were putting the radio tracking data into the computer for further analysis was that the movements of two animals, Arnie and a younger male, appeared to mirror each other in the areas where their two home ranges overlapped. And as it turned out, the computer was actually able to confirm that the younger male was shadowing Arnie. This shadowing is a pretty serious game that koalas play. From Dennis's perspective, it's a time of sizing up his opposition and issuing subtle challenges. From Arnie's perspective, it's a test of his endurance, his stamina and his patience. And uh, it's interesting watching the two of them sort of waltz around each other like a pair of boxes in a ring. And uh, I guess underlying all of that is the, the threat that one day the challenge will become real. If we look at Arnie's home range and that of Dennis, we can see that they overlap. And as Arnie moves about, particularly in this area, Dennis shadows him. Every now and then, Arnie pushes him back without even actually having to touch him. If Marie is ready to mate and Dennis finds her first, there could well be trouble. And there is. Dennis has pursued Marie up a tree. And Arnie is not impressed. Arnie must be vigilant in defending his place in the male hierarchy. The paternity of Marie's young will depend on the outcome of this challenge. The two males fight for the favours of Marie. While Dennis has been put in his place this time, one day he'll try again. But for now, Arnie remains king. On the other side of the forest, Lulu waits patiently for Arnie. But Marie has captured his attention by bellowing, rare behaviour for females. <coughs> Marie 
Marie is only just free of Arnie's son from last year, but will give birth again in a matter of weeks. By the following morning, Lulu is tired of waiting and sets out in search of Arnie. She follows his distinctive bellows, which can be heard more than one kilometre away. It's lusty and throatier and, uh, and more robust, probably because of just his sheer size. It uh, gives him that extra resonance he needs to uh, project his voice long distances. In a pristine forest, Lulu's journey would present only a few natural obstacles. Koalas rarely enter the water and swim poorly, but Lulu is determined in her pursuit of Ani. forests remain in their natural state and Lulu is faced with the threats of her rapidly changing world and foreign invaders. Cattle mistrust anything unusual. With no trees as refuge, Lulu risks being trampled. She approaches one of the first roads of the housing development. Hundreds of koalas are killed on the roads every year. By the following morning, Lulu's finally found Arnie. Well, I guess the biggest distance that she travelled was, was certainly in excess of a kilometre, and that was from one end of Arnie's home range to the other. He wasn't there when she needed him to be, and so, as any assertive young woman, she uh, took it upon herself to go and get him, and she did. Females prefer to mate with Arnie, because his genes will give their young the best chance of survival. With the breeding season over, females return to their territories and life in the trees returns to normal. The young conceived from this season's matings are born five weeks later. Like all marsupials, newborn koalas are undeveloped and barely the size of a peanut. They crawl up into their mother's pouch and attach to one of her two teats. There they stay suckling, nourished by their mother's milk. After 13 weeks, they begin to grow fur. At 22 weeks, they finally open their eyes to winter. A koala's fur provides the most effective insulation of all the marsupials.
curling into a ball allows them to retain this warmth. And sleeping is their way of coping with a low nutrient diet of eucalypt leaves. Koalas are able to survive on this exclusive diet by becoming energy misers. But there's no rest for Arnie. Even out of the breeding season, he must patrol his home range and keep an eye on his females. At the same time, the research team keeps an eye on Arnie. Every six months or so, we need to replace his transmitter, um, put a new battery on, uh, occasionally take a blood sample to monitor his disease status, and general keep a, a good eye on his fitness. When we first caught him, he was an awesome size. He was 10 and a half kilograms. And he spent a very hectic breeding season. The need to maintain the boundaries of your home range, fend off subordinate males on the outside, mate with the females, know where they are. His life would have been so complicated. Now, when you're making those sorts of movements, you're obviously chewing up a lot of energy. But when we caught him again to replace his collar, he actually weighed 500 grams more. He just put on weight. It's one of the things that has been a mystery to us. Is it something that's genetic or is it hormone governed rather than nutrient intake governed? While Arnie's weight may be a product of his genetic makeup, for most koalas, it is simply to do with the amount of leaves they eat and the energy they conserve. In this forest, there are over a dozen different types of eucalypt but the koalas choose to feed on only two or three species. Steve has fought hard for the preservation of these food trees. As a process of this development, the subdivision and the road design has been placed around those trees rather than what would normally happen is they'd probably go straight through them. It's early spring and Marie's young, Didge, is now old enough to come out of her pouch. But his digestive system is not yet ready to cope with the fibrous diet of eucalypt leaves. He must first consume a special excreta produced by his mother. Known as PAP, it contains the bacteria needed to start the difficult digestion process. It is instinctively eaten by all koalas of this age. At this stage, Didge still suckles. He rapidly puts on weight as gum leaves form more of his diet. Koalas have a natural preference for the young succulent leaves, which are more easily digested. When they're not available, they carefully select the most palatable of the mature leaves, using their refined sense of smell. Their digestion is a slow process. While each of these leaves is made up primarily of cellulose and water, they also contain a toxic cocktail of oils. Remarkably, koalas are able to process these compounds, which would be deadly to most other mammals. Finally, the toxins are excreted as bile or urine. It's no wonder that koalas lead such lethargic lives, given that their diet is both toxic and low in energy. As summer approaches, the youngsters spend more time out of the pouch 
and on their mother's backs. It's an awkward time, both for the young and their tolerant mothers. At this time, the mother's nipples extend so that they can still be reached from outside the pouch. But for some, the comfort and warmth of the pouch is irresistible. With two mouths to feed, mothers seek out the most nutritious leaves. Travelling overland is a vulnerable time for koalas, and these little jockeys must learn to sit firm. Climbing over and clinging to thick fur is all part of the training for an independent life in the trees. A young koala on its own would be tempting prey for this powerful owl. For this evening, it has satisfied itself with a young possum and poses little threat. young Nadu has begun to make short forays on her own. The process of separation is a slow one. It may take weeks for Nadu to venture even a metre from her mother. And for good reason, even short excursions can be dangerous. Goannas relish an opportunity like this. quick to respond to Nadu's alarm call. Even the highest treetops offer no refuge from the diamond python. While diamond pythons can easily scale trees, Lulu and Nadu are one leap ahead. Natural predators are a fact of life for koalas and don't take a great toll on their numbers.
Bushfires are a more serious threat to their survival and have long been a natural part of the Australian landscape. They play a vital role in the regeneration of many plant species, including eucalypts. But while wombats can escape to the safety of their burrows and birds can take to the skies, koalas have nowhere to run. In the aftermath of a wildfire, an intensive care ward is full of koalas suffering serious burns, smoke inhalation and dehydration. Volunteer koala carers are experienced with this scenario. They lovingly nurse their wounds. While some don't survive, many do and can be released back into the wild when they've made a total recovery and their food supply is replenished. The role that the carers play is becoming increasingly valuable. They're getting animals back out there who may play a very pivotal role in keeping this population going long term. Despite their second chance at life, there are no guarantees for their future, as there is one threat which is not intermittent, but ever present. Dogs. There's no such thing as a koala-friendly dog. They are all innate hunters and killers. And if you're going to truly move towards a koala-friendly environment, you cannot have a single dog. Although Steve has forced a ban on dogs within the estate, they hunt nearby. Summer again, and Didge has grown bigger and bolder. The Australian bush comes alive at night. While the tawny frogmouth shows little interest, Didge finds a potential playmate in this inquisitive squirrel glider.
Stitch and Marie go in search of fresh leaves. Neither Marie nor Ditch realize that danger lurks nearby. In her panic, Marie chooses too small a tree. have killed Ditch's mother. <coughs> Ditch is found injured and taken to a vet. He asks for help from okay. Beverly Bertels, a koala carer. And he's very fortunate, actually. He hasn't had any bad lacerations at all, but he's very badly bruised down along his back here, mm -hmm. okay? So just be very careful how you're handling him and try not to push him around here because he'll really resent that. Thank you very much, Graham. One more for the menagerie. You look yes. like really well. You never know whether the dogs have um, done internal damage. In the first two or three weeks, this touch and go, we didn't know if he was going to live or not. Beverly and her husband, Bob, look after native animals that have been injured or orphaned. Her koala patients are all victims of bushfire, cars or dog attack. These two have made a complete recovery and are ready to be released back into the wild. But Beverly's work is never ending. The tiniest of her patients is a two month old koala whose mother was killed by a car. Um, there's a lot of eye movement, even though the eyes aren't open. So he's obviously aware of what's going on around him. You know, he must miss his mother and he calls for her. A koala of this age would not have left its mother's pouch and despite Beverly's efforts, has little chance of survival. Having inherited Arnie's strength, Didge has made a rapid recovery and has settled in with his surrogate parents. the personality develop as they get bigger and um, oh, he's been very outgoing and he's been a real ham. He's one in a million. It's going to be very hard to release him later. It's late summer, and Deej is ready to go back into Arnie's world. As the time for his release draws near, Beverly has tried to reduce his dependence on her. Well, I, I know that if we uh, put him anywhere that's uh, important to Arnie, he'll get a clip over the ears mm -hmm. and put on his way very quickly, but uh, if we put him in his mum's home range, I think that yeah. would give him a fair bit of breathing space for a while. Up we go. Up we go. Ditch has made his mark both on Beverly and Steve. Up we go. 
Few people come to understand individual koalas so intimately. When you work with the full spectrum of koala society, from the little juveniles to the big bull-headed males, there's a great variety of personalities inherent in any population. And it's only when you start working closely with them that you really get a chance to see that. One of the features of all Australian wildlife, but it's particularly noticeable in koalas, is their innate gentleness. And again, when you work with them and you experience that gentleness, you show them that respect and you treat them with the same gentleness, they're a totally different animal to work with. Steve's research is over for now, and he releases Arnie for the last time. I have so much affection for him, which is bad science, but he's taught me so much, and I have a great deal of respect for him. Steve won't know the fate of Arnie and his group for many years. But with vital trees protected, cars slowed, and dogs excluded, these koalas stand a chance. For Arnie, life must go on, patrolling this strange new world to maintain his dominance.